hard. Um, any questions so far about anything in the class? Um, anything that's going on? Any deadlines? I think by now it's all, it's, we seem to be rolling pretty good. Is this week seven? Wow, yeah. We better, everyone's like, yeah. All right, good. Uh, could you quickly review the coming deadlines for the next week? It's kind of like a, a new, like a daily show, old business or something like that. I'll do that, sure. Hey, here's what we got going on. It looks like um, uh, to, 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 to dive, the, um, the whole thing is due October 8th, if uh, I'm seeing that correctly. So right, by this Thursday. So that'd be a good idea to post today. That'd be a good idea to post, um, sorry, I'm trying to adjust my screen. That'd be a good idea to post tomorrow and post the next day. If you haven't, you have to have at least uh, three posts total. More is fantastic, all on different days, not multiple ones on the different day or on the last day. So please check that out. Obviously we were talking about waste and I think Dive is um, Dive's a pretty awesome film. Um, we're gonna talk about that in just a second. Uh, let's see. Oh, good, good. Um, October 12th. So next week, Paul Stamets, uh, the, the essay solution essay number two is due and raise your hand or wave. If you've seen any of those videos, if you've checked them out yet, anybody. All right. All right. So maybe one or two people, Paul Stamets genius. And I like to, I really do like to present people with the freaks that are also the geniuses, because that is oftentimes the case. So uh, Michael Reynolds from the Earthship building and Paul Stamets too, very much on the out from the rest of the scientific community for a long time. Now, you know, other governments of other countries are talking to him about how to help save the world with mycelium, with mushrooms. That being said, he is very well respected and is considered the, the leading guy in the entire uh, world. Um, on mushrooms. And so, yeah, but there's a lot of obviously baggage. That's why we talk about it in sociology too, that people have a lot of um, trepidation or whatever associated with mushrooms, right? Um, the scientific community too. So anyway, check out those videos. Um, they're pretty amazing. And, uh, and um, you know, I, I think I've got some posted for that, uh, but I want to make sure that's your solution essay. So if you need any extra feedback from any of the solution essays, if you're typing and you want to know if you're specific enough, reach out to me, reach out to the GTAs. All right. Uh, we have three different responses for dive. There's always a first response a week in advance of the due date and at least two more. So yes. Yep. It's, I mean, technically it's your post and two responses, but these are easy, 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 easy points. So why not log on every other day during a discussion and see what somebody said and then reach out and say something in response. Um, you know, it doesn't have to be the minimum of three. If you really, again, it's like the solution paper. Most of my students, um, if we have a big paper or something due, are willing to do just a little bit less. And I'm, I'm not saying that about you, like overall, if I have a five page paper, people will do like four and a half pages or four and three fourths. If you wanna stand out in this world, do five and a quarter. I mean, I'm not even asking you to do a whole lot more, but just do a little extra. Um, so on these responses, do four or five responses to people. I mean, when people are scrolling the GTAs and myself through grading this, how active and how involved are you? Easy points. All right. Uh, so that's basically what's going on right now. But let's talk about the movie dive. Um, I'm going to let you take over uh, because in class I wouldn't be talking. Well, I talk a lot and then I open it up and then I talk and then I open it up. So respond to dive. Everybody's had to have their first post by now. What do you think about it? Has anybody here ever done dumpster diving or freeganism? Do you like the idea? Does it sketch you out? Uh, yeah, any part of the movie in particular that stands out to you? What do you think? And I guess rest in peace, Eddie Van Halen. I grew up with Van Halen. Uh, just hardcore when I was in the 80s, in the middle of the 80s, and uh, he passed away. So anyway, but besides that, um, what do you think? Any reactions to the movie Dive? So um, dumpster diving was always like, to me, I thought it was just like homeless people like running, like rummaging through trash, but this is just completely blown out my view. It's like 
people living in homes looking for actual food that <laughs> throw away, just like normal, good, edible food. Yeah. Uh, a couple things there, right? Which is what are our expectations, you know, kind of going into it. And then the other thing would be the, the quality of the food. I mean, it's kind of mind blowing, isn't it? Just how much, I mean, we're talking about steaks and cheese from the Alps, <laughs> if I remember correctly. I mean, stuff that traveled a long distance and that people put thought into and, you know, before the due date being thrown out. Good. So um, that's some, that's a, a great sociological sort of in, intro to this, you know, expectations. So uh, include that. Yeah, good. What were you expecting? What surprised you? What did you like about it? Other thoughts about it? I thought it was kind of interesting that, like, Trader Joe's, like, wouldn't even have a meeting with him, like, when he asked him and, like, sent him letters. They kind of just were like, stop talking to us. Right. Pretty sweet, huh? I think they told him to stop talking to them, and then he, like, addressed even more, you know, like, one for every single day. Um, yeah, you know, I don't know that we expect big companies to be, like, accessible, but I think that they have that image, right? They kind of play up that image that they're accessible, so obviously not the case in this one. Um, even though they have a specialist to talk to and about these things. Every, I mean, every company has a public relations specialist, somebody that gets paid big bucks to make sure that when the fit hits the shan, um, that somebody's there to take care of it. But they seemed pretty uninterested overall as far as addressing his concerns, yeah. Uh, who else? Other thoughts? Good. I was pretty frustrated with Trader Joe's response about all of this and like how non-transparent they were with like their own customers and I work at Lucky's Market and I was like this show I mean this documentary made me really curious about what we do with our food waste so I like went to my manager and who like manages through like all this and has a really big part in making these like big company decisions and he was like so so transparent with me and like I was not disappointed in the response and I was just like <laughs> very really happy like really happy for like the company that I work for and it makes me just realize how important it is to like do your research on like where you're going to spend your money because so, you are voting every single day with your money and yeah, yeah. <laughs> look first things first yes and I'm sorry to interrupt but you, every time you spend money on something you're voting for it okay that could be crappy tacos at 2 a.m whatever no judgment here it could or, or it could be, <laughs> it could be whatever it could be recycled so, like look whatever but you are spending that money, that's the equivalent of a vote because it sends a message to all sorts of folks. Um, could you please tell us, Susan, um, like what's their policy at Lucky's? See, my partner works at Vitamin Cottage. I've been like, love the product, love the store. Now through COVID, it just grinded on my gears. They will not support their uh, employees with masking initiatives. They won't enforce it at the door. They got a security guy who's like, guard who's like 6'3 at the front of Whole Foods. Um, but I haven't been into Trader Joe's, haven't been into Lucky's. What's their policy about food waste? And then maybe tell us a little bit about their COVID policy, just because I'm curious. Yeah, um, so for food waste, um, Lucky's does a really good job at uh, like giving customers the choice of like, um, marks down items if they're like running expired first and like if they don't go if they don't sell then then they're offered to team members like we have like a bunch of like discounted um, boxes in the back and I definitely get a lot of my groceries there just because like it helps a lot like financially and also like it just further proves the point that like if you eat expired foods you're gonna be fine like I'm I feel great you know it's <laughs> it's um, totally good and then they also have a lot of free food in the break room that's like at no cost to team members. Um, everything that doesn't go there, um, like produce and meats and stuff that are more perishable, they try to use it in other departments first. So we have like obviously uh, meats and then like produce. And then if those are starting to go bad a little bit, we have a VA in produce that like takes, like cuts off like the bad parts of the fruit or vegetable and like juices it wow. or like cuts it off and then um pack, a, you know like those like package yeah no for sure it's like sounds like a fun job though like you just like make smoothies and stuff with like bad produce <laughs> um no it's not bad produce it's just like not as like pretty right. for like marketing and then 
if it doesn't go there, then I'll go to culinary. And that's where a lot of like uh, meats that are like on the brink of like market expiration will go to and they'll like cook it up there, then it's fine. And then it's like resold that way. If oh. it doesn't get used there, then um, we look to the food banks and then we donate things to the food banks. Um, and if it doesn't go there, <laughs> then oh, wow. we resort to composting. Um, basically, like most of our things, like there's very few things like meat that can't really be composted that go into the trash. And since this is like a little background story about Lucky's is that like there used to be 44 stores across the nation that would like do about a lot of these um, processes, but then basically Kroger like backed out of the deal. So like a lot of companies, I mean, a lot of Lucky's locations shut down because they couldn't sustain themselves, but the only two were Boulder and Fort Collins left and which is like, says a lot about our community first of all, but they lost a lot of connections when that happened, but they used to like donate all the meat to like wolf sanctuaries and um, like, <laughs> like Seriously. literally it was such an extensive answer. This is I was like deep. so happy. I was like, yeah, that's, that this makes... <laughs> the deepest like thing ever that I've ever right? heard any grocery store commit to not yeah. total loss of food. This is my, I know I'm like really like I love my job there and I, I'm a cashier so I like talk to people all the time like the community like Lucky's attracts like it's just that everyone's like so like environmentally like sure thoughtful and conscious and wow. um and if you go in there and you don't wear a mask like chances are like I will be like one of those people like chasing you around I like almost got punched like the other day because this girl was not wearing a mask and I I, I just like asked her nicely like hey do you have a mask and she was like very upset with me and but like I'm gonna enforce it because I think that's important for public <laughs> health so and I'm doing right. my job so um yeah and awesome. you, you can bring in your own bags as well we just ask like you don't keep like touch our surfaces and so most people bag into carts um or right. just like hold, hold the bag up and you know stick right. stuff in there well that's a uh, look okay is it really that hard? Come on, everybody, right? Like that's every single grocery store could do that. Like make greater connections with the community, compost, wolf sanctuary. Of course there's animals that this food could be fed to. I mean, that's just, you have to consider the volume of waste. We're not talking about one grocery store. We're talking about chains with hundreds, if not thousands of grocery stores and that food um is largely going to waste yeah at tiger king there you go it takes a lot of takes a lot of food to feed those takes a lot of ex-husbands to feed those tigers ah oh, i digress hey -o. um okay okay so so that's that's pretty amazing right there okay okay so let's reel it back into the movie but as a comprehensive rundown that's absolutely awesome i mean that is a store that is trying and a chain that used to own or have investments in them that gave up, right? I mean, less grocery stores need to just fold right now because that's uh, obviously one of our biggest sources of waste. Okay, good, good. Um, all right, so back to um, back to dive. Uh, has anybody had experience with that? Other things that stand out from the film? Um, obviously, his kids involved in being super cute, but I also think that there's some great stuff there. Um, yeah, other thoughts, go ahead. So I've heard that the expiration date is more like a suggestion that after the date, it's not actually bad a lot of the time. So if these people are dumpster diving and they're saying meat out of the trash can is salvageable, when is meat not salvageable then? Well, I guess a couple things first. One, I do find that most of my students yet don't quite have a great grasp and many adults on just what that means, right? Like what does the expiration date mean? How far should I go with something? Um, and let's be honest and true and uh, totally transparent here. Bacteria is real and at certain temperatures, bacteria thrives. But we also know that most of these meat processing plants like in Greeley, they have to like ammonia super sub-zero freeze their meat because of the amount of, um, you know, poop feces that gets on it. And then that meat has to be cooked to a very high temperature um, <clears throat> to escape people getting sick from it. So a few things, 
yes, bacteria is real. People, you know, you can stem that tide by refrigerating something, freezing something, and or cooking the heck out of something. Um, and then there is just that people need to get closer with their food, take the meat out of the package. Almost instantly, you can tell whether that's good or not and whether that's safe or not by the smell of it. And I think that there are some things that you have um, that you can fudge a little more with, um, things that have been frozen for long periods of time, things like that. And then there's things like meats that, you know, people need to be really careful with. Um, that being said, if it's not smelling awful. And if you're within a, a pretty close on the due date, it's like milk or most things. You need to be able to check that out for yourself. You can tell when milk's gone bad. You can really tell if you smell it enough when it's borderline. Same with meat. Um, and, and of course, then there's, um, you know, what I think is the positive, and that's erring on the side of caution. And, and really, these companies don't want to get sued. Let's break it down, okay? Even though during the Clinton administration, they signed, he signed into an executive order, and I can't remember what that order is, but I think it's in my um, lecture somewhere um, that, you know, you can't be sued if you're donating that food, you know? So within a reasonable and responsible amount, at the very least, we could cut some of that food waste off, get it to other animals, do, yeah, the Good Samaritan Act, do something with it, you know? So yeah, but I do believe that um, there's an important element there, which is meat that's not frozen or refrigerated, you know, within certain times can be very dangerous, obviously, but so can the conditions under which people process lettuce. Um, depending on what they're fertilizing it with and how dirty of an environment it's processed in, because you see that recalled all the time for salmonella as well. And really what we're talking about here is a giant food system. When a food system is so big and shipped so far that it becomes dangerous in and of itself. Um, and there's a really great guy, Joel Salatin, who I frequently tell people to uh, check out, Polyface Farms. That guy was here at CSU just a handful of years ago. He's one of the most amazing farmers out there. And he'll process his chickens in open air on the farm and have less parts per million of bacteria than major chicken processing plants after they ammonia it, after they freeze it, after the, you know what I'm saying, after they do all sorts of really excessive chemical things to make it lower parts per million. Um, and of course, some of that is expected in processing. Good. Um, other things that stand out in the dive. Would you do it? Would you not? Is it because it's illegal? Because my mom, like, she just won't do something if it's illegal. That, that's her line in the sand. You know, she lives in Illinois. Even though she had really bad muscle and pain and fibromyalgia, she wasn't about to try cannabis. They legalize it. Maybe mom's, you know, changed her mind. I can't say she'd get mad at me. Uh, but, but for some people, it's just the legality of it. Like if you have to climb a fence and open up a garbage can, you're not gonna do it. And I get that too, but have you done it? Would you do it? Or what else stands out? And then I'll be quiet. Is it illegal because it's trespassing or is there another law? Yeah, it's, it's trespassing. So it depends how, obviously, how much people choose to enforce it. How about that one guy? He's got glasses, he's dressed nice, he's a person of European descent, he walks up to the cop, he introduces himself, he shakes his hand. That's not how everybody's gonna be treated at a dumpster, depending, right? You know what I'm saying? Um, obviously, because there's bias within our policing system um, and some pretty big bias, but yeah, trespassing would be it. Now, that doesn't mean that everybody that uh, gets caught while they're doing that, like that people want to press charges, that people are going to be called in the first place, that the police have the time to address that. I think the guy who showed up in the film was maybe a private security firm or something like that. I can't remember. Yeah, the laws would be, would probably be trespassing, but, but a lot of stuff could be dumped directly into an alley in the dumpster. And then people started locking the dumpsters and they have. Whereas I would say a decade ago when I was doing this, when we were doing social experiments and the people I knew were in Chicago and stuff like that, it was very infrequent, um, you know, to find dumpsters locked kind of thing. So what else stands out? Go ahead, sorry. I thought it was um, really interesting, and this re also relates to Garbage Warrior, this idea of like one man's trash is another man's treasure type of thing. Um, and I think it just highlights how we have to 
change our view on food or change our view on trash in general. Um, on waste, yeah. Yeah, waste, <laughs> waste right. in general. Um, yeah, and if, if, we, if we can change our view um, of waste, of trash, of um, food, then we can better use it. We can, you can, we can utilize it to its fullest extent. Um, yeah. Yeah, and, and to me, this seems, uh, I don't know, I don't want to be rude, but this seems like a no-brainer. This seems like at every level, in every town, you could organize something for less food waste from restaurants, from grocery store. I mean, this should be something that's mandated uh, so that it does some good feeding something or someone while at the same time being kept out of landfill. I mean, there's so many positives to it. I don't, I don't know. Maybe somebody picks that up someday and runs with it um, in this town or in every town. And hopefully maybe on the federal level, food waste could be looked at a little more um, thoughtfully for sure. Yeah. Uh, other things, other things that stand out to you about it. Um, I was thinking about like portion size in relation to food waste um, because I'm from Chicago and like when we go out to eat, yeah, when we go out to eat, they give us like so much food, <laughs> but it's normal. And then my mom and I like took a trip to Portland, Oregon a couple of years ago. And like when we got our food, we were just like so shocked by how like appropriate the <laughs> portion sizes were, I guess, like in regard to like Chicago portion sizes. And, like, yeah. Yeah. And I never thought about that like in terms of food waste, I guess, and how all the food you don't eat with the larger portion just like ends up in the trash, I don't know. Yeah, no, that's, I, I think that's great. That's geographic and regional sociology. I will, I'm from the Midwest. Like I said before, almost every place had a buffet. At like the KFC had a buffet. The Wind, Wendy's, had, good Lord, had a buffet. Um, I mean, Portion sizes are as big as they can be for people in the Midwest or just buffet. That's portion size taken like to the next level, right? Like forget a huge portion size, limitless. I mean, yeah. And, and I think that you bring up a great point, which is Portland and Oregon in general and the West Coast, so much different level of consciousness about so many different things, whether that's recycling in the community. They have machines in Portland and around that area where you just like the homeless population can go around and they do picking up cans, taking them directly to machines. The machines crush the cans, they give them money and they're cleaning the community and it's, and, and hey, you know, like, that's an amazing thing. I mean, I don't know how long that's going to take for Illinois. We don't even have bicycle lanes in my hometown. So I'm going to say it's not happening for a while. So great, great idea. Yeah, just the portion size and food waste regionally, geographically. I mean, if it's this way in Minnesota and Illinois, am I, would I be thinking right that, like, Texas is even, prides themselves on even, even, Bigger portions? I don't know. See, this is so. This is totally a sociology thing. You know what I'm saying? It has to do with like level of consciousness of people in an area and impression. When you go down to Texas, and that we had talked about food waste through trying to save face through cultural things. I mean, that's a great example. You know, maybe Texas gives you like two steaks just because. Like, here's your heart attack. Here's your stroke. Have at it. All right. Yeah, it's it's actually interesting because my mom and I went directly from Portland to Austin, Texas, like on a flight, and the the portion sizes in Texas are very big. <laughs> right, does not surprise me. Awesome. All right, what else about um? So we've got portion size. We've got all sorts of things here. Any what else stands out, or do you think is a good idea, or strikes you in an odd way? Anything? What do you think? Um, I guess most of the waste in the dumpster was food scraps obviously because it was at a grocery store but I was just surprised how much of it I guess was clean and still like in its like container and package that was able to like not only like good to eat because of like the expiration date but clean to eat because it was packaged I guess still in, in its container yeah um still packaged right and, and a lot, we talk a lot about waste and plastic and styrofoam and things like that. So obviously a lot of those things that are not compostable, not recyclable on top of it. So 
Yeah, I mean, you're pulling out, they were pulling out whole bags that had everything packaged inside that bag. You know, 40 packs of chickens, 20 steaks, uh, however many individually wrapped things of cheese. Yeah, definitely, good, good. Texas has lots of places where their food is big, but people in Texas, at least where I live, eat their whole thing. There you go. <laughs> so there's that too. <laughs> um, in my hometown, um, I'm sure it's like a lot of places in the Midwest where it's like booming and there's lots of construction as far as houses. And my dad made it like a note of it and as a habit, he's more of like a self-made carpenter and mm -hmm. he refuses to buy wood. He only gets wood at construction sites because they throw away like whole um, like planks and whatnot that you would want. Um, but a lot of good wood, like cherry wood, everything, they just like have scraps and like whole pieces. And then, yeah, so like a lot of sources of waste outside of food in dumpsters as well. Um, I know the only dumpster diving I've ever done was when people are moving out in my neighborhood and they throw away all of their toys. And like when I was a child, um, right. but like all, also all of the chairs, anything they didn't want, they just got a dumpster to throw it all out. So that was like a routine thing that my brother and I would do. Right. Uh, I've done that for uh, supplies for sure. When I lived in Loveland, I built a whole chicken coop based on uh, just everything I found from job sites that were in the dumpsters that were, you know, sheetrock and you name it, pretty, pretty much everything, but, but screws or something like that. But yeah, good. So other things that can waste that you can dumpster dive for as well, even if you're not interested in eating something out of the dumpster. Uh, other reactions to the film? I thought the way that he was teaching his son about food waste at like such an early age, you know, his son looks like two or three in the film. I think that's really important because if we don't learn those habits when we're young, it's harder for us to change our behaviors when we get older. Yep, yep, great piece right there for sure. We got chickens um, when the boys were really little, really, really little, and Storm fell in love with them immediately. Uh, and so he stopped eating chicken, um, and yeah, just went full on for a while and only returned a few years ago when we did our own round of chickens, slaughtered our own round of chickens because he wanted to honor them, but, but went many, many years without that. Um, but they got all, all immediately our food waste went from like, whatever that is to nothing, like whatever that was, it wasn't a lot, but nothing, you know? And so that's the other piece here really by seeing how easy it was for us. And I can't possibly give my chickens enough scraps every day. Like they're like little velociraptors, just a whole bunch of little velociraptors. You put like, you put a little, you put anything in there and they're just like little piranhas going to eat it immediately. Um, and so it would be a really, really accessible, really easy thing to do to cut down on your food waste just, just with poultry, let alone all the farms around that have pigs. And of course there's big operations and, and things like that. And there is a lot of food waste, but um, this is, yeah, a really simple thing. And, you know, the boys understood it at a very early age and we were just teaching them about backyard chickens, but what they really got to learn about was food waste, you know, and it's fun. It's fun when you go throw this stuff out there because they cruise out and then they like, go for it. So it was like, you know, like I said, we couldn't have enough waste in our house, food waste for the boys to want to take the buckets out to the chickens because it became a really fun thing. So I think you could make it a, a cool thing easily as well, you know, um, instead of like having some stigma attached to, to food. But now people are composting with it. There's so much use for food waste right now. And I don't think that people perceived what they would use it for necessarily for the longest time. All right. Other things that stand out to you about this. Anybody else? I feel like there's nothing more frustrating than seeing solutions to a problem right in front of you. And I feel like that was what this film was. Um, Cause I feel like stores could easily with the Good Samaritan Act donate to shelters or homes or things like that. Or um, I know it brought up, you know, using waste and feeding that to our animals, um, whether it be in a zoo type environment or even on a farm. I feel like that would be a great use of food waste um, or even just composting. Um, right. like I started brainstorming. I was like, why don't at like landfills, they have a compost section because I know CSU compost their own food waste and they use that for their soil. So I feel like so much more is wasted with food, like energy, time and money, especially when it comes to growing it. So 
why not like compost it and put it back into that and use the soil for farming, you know? Yeah, I do. Um, I mean, if we're going to talk about cleaning up water or the air or fixing the ozone, I mean, that stuff sounds intense, right? Whereas this is, makes a, could make a huge impact and is very, 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 very accessible. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Um, yeah, frustrating uh, because this is such an easy one. I think this is one that if we put our minds to it in no amount of time with very little creativity and a few people going after it, um, this would be, this would be big time. Yep. Yeah. Companies to take that food waste to local farms outside the city. I know that, Oh, Hey, there's um, somebody that I know that uh, comes to some of the festivals and the races that I would MC um, compost queen. So that's a, a new business in the last couple of years in Fort Collins. Check them out. Just somebody, uh, a husband and wife that are doing their thing with composting, you know, and they're looking for like to do more and, and more and more. So that's like an individual. And I know that they're making a good run of it with the business. See any of these things here that you're really passionate about. I think that generations before us, like my mom's generation and dad's generation, it was like work this one job forever, do it. But now my generation has two or three professions during the course of a lifetime. Your generation is supposed to have four or five or six or eight different professions and jobs. You know, one of the things that I think is key for you folks that are passionate is to not rely always on other people. I mean, be connected through the community, but you don't have to work for somebody to do something extremely important, totally successful, ridiculously creative and, uh, and really helpful you know, for, for the earth or whatever your passion might be. So, yep, keep that open always. Uh, City Collect Compost sells it back to farmers. Um, that, that, look, again, absolutely. And I'm gonna say this too, we don't even need to come up with anything ourselves. I guarantee you places like Portland and other cities in the United States already have the most fantastic ideas for how to do stuff like this. So you don't even have to reinvent or invent something from scratch. So, great. All right, uh, anybody else with the movie? Going once, going twice. Three times a lady. Nope, all right. I guess cool. I just have a quick, sorry, I just have a quick comment about how like, I don't understand why it's such an in inconvenience to society to just like change to these ways. It's not like anybody is losing any, like I don't see what the big inconvenience would be in like, why there people just don't see like how much more the positive outweighs the negative and i don't know i just it's just like very frustrating because i'm like the answer is right there dude like it's right there <laughs> um, it is um and that's i think what we can use sociology for right use sociology to understand where people are coming from to understand social mechanisms to get a diverse set of opinions and views so that you know how to use that information to best take on bureaucracy, to best change collective action, change the momentum of what's going on. Like this sociology is absolutely a change-based major and area of study and everything like that. Yeah, because you learn, I think, how those things work and then how you can manipulate it so that you could get those people to realize that that would be a fantastic thing, whatever that is, right? Greater equality for gender, greater diversity equality, um, being able to uh, integrate some kind of food waste program when bureaucracy in a locality couldn't understand it, change the way we build, right? Like Michael Reynolds was doing. I mean, this is, this is a good, it's a good background, I think, and a good way to approach um, the environment for this class, but also like the other things that you're looking at making positive changes with, for sure. Um, it's big corporations, they lose money when people are woke. Well, more and more people are relying on food systems that are closer and closer, more people are growing gardens, more people are getting backyard chickens. There's a lot of this COVID business that's trash, I get it. But then there's a lot of people doing things and returning to ways that they haven't for a while being more community oriented, not traveling as far and maybe getting your food more locally, growing it yourself. When we went to get seeds and chickens this spring and we're on top of it, we're like earlier than everyone else, half the places were half sold out or the chickens were like two, three months out. So, and that's still the case. So, you know, I think one thing with, in regards to food and food waste is watching people reconnect with food in a more local, smaller food system. 
Um, and that's not a dream anymore. That's very accessible in most communities. My parents in Illinois that doesn't have bike lanes, I know I get after Freeport, but they have a couple shares in an organic CSA where the, this woman's uh, husband started a brewery. I mean, you know, like, <laughs> sounds a lot like Fort Collins, right? But hey, there they are in the middle of Illinois and they've got access to it. So that is not becoming such a rare thing for sure. All right, um, good. So we're moving into uh, the chapter on waste and let's see, we have, or excuse me, on biodiversity. We've got some questions about that. I'll read a couple right now. Are you concerned about the dramatic die off of bees? 47 yes to no. Um, and I asked that question kind of kind of twice. And we're gonna look at biodiversity. And so let me look at this real quick here. Let's pop up to this. See if I can screen share for a second. There we go. Let's do that. Um, so you see this everybody? Check that out or whatever. Good, just wanna make sure it's working. We're gonna talk about biodiversity. I'm not gonna get into it a great deal today. Um, but we're gonna be looking at all sorts of things. Now obviously, there's biodiversity that we know, that we know is like, you know, dying, that's going extinct, polar bears, and, and recently a bunch of uh, elephants, I believe in Africa, because of this algae bloom that was going on. And they weren't sure why it was killing them. I mean, it, a lot of them. And so there's that kind of biodiversity that we know about, that we can see that we lose. There's bees that we might not notice, but now we know is on the out. Um, and then there's just the biodiversity in a river or in a handful of dirt or whatever that might be that we don't even know. Organisms that are too small for us to understand or see anything, anything like that. So it's important to know as we talk about biodiversity that, look, the word diversity is in it. And I know I've mentioned it before, but we come back around here to the same thing. The more diverse it is, the better it functions. And I don't care whether you're talking about a river you can't pull something out of that chain, or I don't care if you're talking about human beings, you can't just decide that people of a certain nationality or color are worthless and try and pull them out and expect things to work well. It does not. So the same is true with biodiversity. The more you preserve rivers, the more we don't poison and take out things out of that chain, the stronger it is. Bees are a big deal, right? People in here express that they're uh, very concerned. Some people sort of um, there was hardly anybody in little or not at all. I think that's the bee guy from Simpsons. Simpsons maybe has fallen a long way, but you know, they're still funny, I guess. Bob's Burgers, that's my jam. Love it. All right. So let's talk about breakfast with, uh, without bees. Here's a picture of a couple things. And so what would change without bees and pollination? Take a look at this and you chime in now. What's, what, what would change without bees, just as far as like something simple that we maybe take for granted like breakfast. There aren't almonds on the other side. Yep, um, yep, nuts uh, uh, like almonds require pollination, big time bee pollination and so much so that they actually move colonies of tens of millions of bees from one place and ship them all the way across country to like California and then let them do their season uh, of being a bee inside these giant almond groves. Um, and in places like China and India and other places, you actually, actually have human beings that are climbing into trees with paintbrushes that are hand pollinating. Now, I see the looks on some of your faces, and that is how your face should look, because conceptualize that once, folks. We cannot ever get back the biodynamic services that our biodiversity like provides for us in any kind of way that makes any sense fiscally conservatively. Do you know what I'm saying? Meaning, biodiversity, the bees do a job that if human beings were trying to do it, we'd never be able to do it. It would cost tens of billions of dollars. It wouldn't even make it worth it. So if, right, again, we return back to this piece, which is I don't think that people are, who are truly conservative would ignore the environment because you save so much money by preserving biodiversity. Because right now, we're not talking about when people will be in trees with paintbrushes doing it. It's right now. Check it out, Google it online, pollination, human pollination. You can see the people that are doing it. You can read those videos about it, but it, it doesn't make any sense because it's not 
cost effective if you were to just save your populations of bees. What else is missing here? Um, uh, um, um, I noticed, I noticed the um, fruits or uh, the fruits and vegetables are actually missing. Yep, obviously heavily reliant on pollination for that as well. So those are going to be gone, right? Um, anything else people notice? So all the jelly's gone, all the fruit off the plate, any of the berries, and, and most of the nuts that were in that. What else is missing? The cream and the coffee. Yeah, and I'm going to say that maybe that's still tea, I'm not sure, but how about coffee? This is an important area. This is, this is seriously important. I'm heavily invested in the drug, caffeine. I'm heavily invested in coffee every single morning. So does anybody know about coffee? How would bees not pollinating impact that? What do you think? Still get your coffee in the morning? Anybody know? You wouldn't, wouldn't you? Because doesn't it take the bee to pollinate the yep. bush? It does. Um, you would have some coffee production, but the coffee production, like, is, is, like, your volume of what you produce is so much more, and the quality of what you would produce is so much more. So, yep, even our coffee, ha, ah, would be at risk <laughs> without our bee population. And one of the big deals with that, obviously, is that um, a lot of the plants that we're putting out there now are full of these neonicotinoids. More than half of the ostensibly bee-friendly plants sampled at uh, Home Depot, Lowe's, and Walmarts had high levels of neonicotinoids. These are not um, things that are necessarily sprayed on the plants. They're actually spliced into the genetics of the plant at a release that is determined by geneticists. Um, very highly toxic to bees, butterflies, and other insect pollinators. And of course, um, you could look at this because those neonicotinoids in places, they have, it says bees win their court case, bees have their day in court. Um, you know, to enforce that is one thing, but we now know that glyphosate and neonicotinoids are not only very dangerous to bee populations, but human populations as well. Um, and I think this was just this last year, and, and, and the guy in California who won the court case, African-American guy, um, already being ravaged by cancer, and it's not going to do a whole lot of good for him in his life, but finally able to say not may, but does cause cancer. And these companies have known that. That's the primary ingredient in Roundup. And so again, it's not so much that you're eating an apple and it has glyphosate on it. It's that people are spraying it on their food, they're spraying it on their lawn, they're spraying it on millions and millions of acres on their crops, they're fusing it into the very genetics of the plants that you sell and that they end up giving to kids. Um, got real ticked off a few years ago because uh, one of the gardens in town was using um, Cargill plants that they were giving out to the kids and they were not only genetically modified but they were not labeled as such. Um, and of course, they just wanted to get their product out to kids and into gardens and stuff like that, but sketchy at best, um, and so not transparent. So it's the extent of this use of glyphosate. And when we're looking at, I mean, look, look at this, 12.5 million pounds in 1995 to 250 million pounds in 2014, that is statistically important. An increase of two times is something that people would throw a fit about and draw attention to. An increase of 20 times, it's ridiculous. And it's the cause of a big uptick um, of much of our cancers in human beings as well. So um, not just the individual apple you eat, but just how much of what is allowed sprayed. And then of course these companies pay year in and year out to be able to avoid any type of responsibility even though um, there are hundreds if not thousands of deaths worldwide that are attributed to this. All right, um, we're gonna stop there uh, because we've already had a good discussion about the last chapter. We've just jumped into chapter four. The exam will be over chapters three and four. I'll do a lot of the lecturing on chapter four Thursday. So I'm gonna stop screen sharing this for now. I will upload this because I'm recording it in just a little bit. Um, colony collapse disorder impact bee population greatly. Yep, and I even read something the other day that said in a few places, they're seeing some sort of like resurgence, which is good because we have known about this for a while. Um, 
so one solution to bee populations would just um, be more people doing beekeeping, right? More people doing that on properties like mine where they know they're not being sprayed. Problem is that they go off site and bring a lot of that back to the hive itself, um, you know, which endangers the population. I've even seen things this last year, which is like a really weird response that human beings are having to us talking about climate change. And I've seen, have you seen this in the news over the last couple of years that like bee colonies have been destroyed? Like people go into a place and they destroy like 10,000 of these things. For what reason? I cannot ever imagine. Um, but you can look that up in the news too. It's, it's happening. It's kind of like eco-terrorism in a way. Um, and again, I'm, I'm not sure to serve what purpose. These aren't like, you know, it's not like a gang of bears that's going around <laughs> collecting the honey. It's just people vandalizing, uh, you know, a, an important rung in the ladder of biodiversity that we all depend on for sure. Uh, are they mistaking bees for wasps? No, I'm talking about actual beehive, but not like wild places, but places where people are doing beekeeping, um, going onto people's property and destroying those types of things. Like I, I get how you could maybe not know that at your house or something like that, but I'm talking about some weird kind of other stuff. Anyway, all right, fantastic. This is great. Um, awesome. Yeah, if you have any questions, please reach out to your GTAs. Please reach out to me through email if you have any questions. Um, yeah, yep, absolutely. Be good people and do good things. Take care of each other. Wear a mask. If you get sick, quarantine yourself and help out with contact tracing. The White House didn't tell anybody for over 24 hours and now countless numbers of people are going to be sick and nobody deserves this and adults and people in leadership positions need to do better right? So you do, because you're leading by example, you do your part, all right? And uh, let's hope that people in positions of power um, um, do the same, uh, because we know that this is for real, and the only way we're going to get past that, or around it, or at least live with it, whatever that might be, is science. So I appreciate it, everybody. Take care, be good people, do good things. Talk to you next time. I'll post this in a little bit.